Aloha, and welcome to the latest edition of Telehealth in Hawaii. I'm Vikram Macharya. I'm the CEO of Cloudwell Health, an all virtual physician founded telemedicine organization anchored in Hawaii. We have an amazing show for you today. It is my honor to introduce to you Coach Dick Vermeil. Coach has been a Super Bowl champion, college football champion, founder of Vermeil Wines, and a 2022 inductee into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's an honor to have you on the Coach Show. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Vic. Yeah, I'm doing okay for an old man. I'm, I'm in better <laughs> shape than some of my friends. I'm, I'm getting so I'm, Vic, I'm afraid to pick up the phone. Someone has got a health issue, and I love the guy dearly, and now I, it, I set some you know, a sorry mood the rest of the day. Yeah. That's what happens when you turn 85. <laughs> well, you look great, coach. You look great. You've been a close mentor and inspiration for me. And I just really want to thank you. Thank to you. get things started, coach, you know, talk to me a little bit about your background, where you're from, what got you into coaching, and we'll go from there. Well, Vic, you know, I was born and raised in the Napa Valley, Calistoga, California. I was born in my great grandfather on the Italian side of my family's home. My dad loved it up there, and he took over the home and lived there all his life and uh, opened a garage behind it called Louis Vermeil's Owl Garage. And they nicknamed, nicknamed it the Owl Garage because he worked all night. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's where I was raised. Small high school, 130 kids in the school, and how I got involved with football, playing there, you know, you had to play. There weren't enough, you know, you, know, you needed. <laughs> we usually had about 19, 20 kids on the football team. Every once in a while, you know, I think my senior year, we had about 25. Uh, a new coach came there named Bill Wood. He really inspired me. He told me I could play college football if I wanted to, and I had never thought about that. That sort of started me thinking uh, about football beyond high school. So I went to junior college and played there two years successfully and went on, walked on to San Jose State, earned a scholarship, and, and decided to be a football player coach because of the positive influence that Bill Walsh was on me and also Dr. Mm -hmm. Robert Bronson, my college coach. He was uh, one of those kind of guys that was always uh, telling you what you could do that you didn't know you could do, you know, and that it really helped me get going. Started in high school, then junior college, and as you said, college in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Coach, you know, people like myself are very drawn to you because of the personal connection you build with your players, with the people you work for, the owners. You know, tell us a little bit about how you're able to really connect with people. You know, I've always noticed that that's something that really um, I notice about you a lot. Well, thank you, Vic. I'll accept that as a compliment. You know, it's something that came automatic to me, mm -hmm. maybe because that side of my brain is the dominant side. I, I, I don't consider myself any kind of an, elect, an intellectual or brilliant guy. But the other side of my brain has always worked it favorably for me, you know, social intelligence. And I've always felt I have a natural feel for people. And I think also because how I was raised, a small community, uh, you know, in small communities, everybody's your father. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you, you know, you have a, I had 29 kids in my graduating class, okay. And all the dads of the other kids were like second dads to me. You know, you knew everybody so well and you were always getting, uh, Directed properly, structured properly, disciplined properly, uh, uh, more than most kids would get because you, you were always under somebody's surveillance and you, it helped you keep raising your expectations and learning what's expected of you as you grow. Yeah. And uh, I, I developed, I think, a natural, a, a natural compassion and empathy uh, for people through this process. Mm -hmm. And then I started high school coaching, Vic, and I really loved the kids. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it was so much fun to be with them. And, uh, you know, people always said, who motivates you? And I said, the kids I'm with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I've always been able to uh, recognize the kind of kids that I wanted to work with and, and also the challenging kids that I thought I could help. And I just never changed that approach all the way through pro football. I told many people I was a high school coach, coaching pro football, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's all about, uh, making sure people know you care and, you know, and uh, teaching them that hard work is not a form of punishment. It's a solution. It's a way to get better. You know, I've always said there's no correlation between working less and getting better. Never has been, never will be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids would buy in and all of a sudden they find themselves 
better than they were when they started and start appreciating the value of work and they carry it over into everything else they do. And that's mm -hmm. what I've done. I carried it over into building solid relationships with people beyond just a coach and player. Uh, most of my close friends, real true close friends are people I work with, work for and coached mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. coached, and players that I've cut <laughs> because they always knew I was going to do my job and, and, and because I wanted to be held responsible and uh, but uh, today I probably talked to at least four or five of my different NFL players. One of them, Eric Hicks, about 10 minutes ago, a defensive end from the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm very close to. I doc talked to Dante Hall yesterday. I got an email today from Ken Dunnick, who's, who runs the, the Philly Magazine and New Jersey Man Magazine. He's doing an article on my Hall of Fame induction and mm -hmm. was with Jaworski the other day. Last week I had, you know, dinner with guys. Uh, and tomorrow I'm picking up Frank Lamaster, my linebacker from the Eagles for seven years, and we're going to practice it for the OTA. So to me, it's always been about relationships. And the other thing, Vic, and I, uh, many times just player-coach relationships go deeper than that. There are always people that touch you deeper. And sometimes it's hard to explain. It has sometimes nothing to do with how good a football player he is or if he's the starting center or the third-string guard. Mm -hmm. You know, just certain kinds of people really touch me. And yeah. uh, I hang on to those guys. I'm selfish. I want them in my life. Yeah. They, they, they make me feel better. And I, hopefully I make a contribution to them. Yeah. You know, Coach, when you, when you were coaching players and you wanted, you knew you could get more out of a player, that a player could get to the next level, push to the next level, what types of motivational tactics did you give them? So you knew that they could get to here, but if you wanted to get them to the next level, what types of techniques and things did you do to really get the most out of your players? Well, Vic, first, to do anything with players or anybody, uh, they have to trust you. So you have to invest some time to be trusted. And once you're trusted, then they listen to you. It's different than hearing. They start listening to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, every... Everybody appreciates being appreciated, being praised, and in many ways, being held accountable. And they also like to work for people that are grateful for their efforts. Yeah. You know, and it's not all about Dick Vermeil getting a winning record. It's about we as an organization being successful from the top down mm -hmm. and uh, being unselfish and attacking a problem more than attacking a person. You know, it's so easy when a mistake is made to attack the person, make him feel like an idiot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I always evaluated, well, why did he make the mistake? Maybe we didn't coach him well enough. Maybe mm -hmm. we didn't ingrain the fundamental well enough. And mm -hmm. always uh, left him an out and more willing to, to take the blame. The I always say, if you need credit, go to the bank. That's for the business area. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I, people need reinforcement. They need it. And some people need it more than others. Mm -hmm. And if a guy is really talented and you see it, sometimes they don't see it. I can think of some names mm -hmm. that had no idea they could be as good as they ended up being. Mm -hmm. So and that that would happen to me. That's what Dr. Bronson did to me. He started telling me he 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 put my name in for the freshman coaching job at Notre Dame when Eric Persigian took the job. I didn't even know he did it because he thought that would be a great place for me to start because he saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. I didn't have those kind of expectations. And so I, I think all these things uh, deepen your ability to look into the people, gain more insight into them and, and evaluate them in regard to what they might be able to be. You know, and if you, if you continue to treat people what you think they ought to be, they're more apt to end up being that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so and many times I raise the standard too high. You know, they just, <laughs> you know, they, they just, they just didn't have enough. Especially when it gets to the NFL. Some of the best football players I ever coached were junior college, high school kids, but they weren't big enough to be in the NFL. But if they took those same football playing skills that they had as little guys. And we moved it into a big NFL frame. They'd be a great football player, you know, yeah. at that level. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, that was my approach. Make sure they know you care, number one, though.
Yeah. Yeah. Now, if how about coming back from tough losses? You know, there was, you coached a lot of games, a lot of wins, but also some tough losses. How do you regalvanize the team, regalvanize the person, be resilient enough to come back and say, look, you know, well, this was put this one behind us and we're going to go to the next game. Well, Vic, you remember you and I talked about this. Mm -hmm. Didn't mm -hmm. go real well in the hospital and could have shut it down and all that. We're yeah. just closed right to this day, seven yeah. miles away. There's no hospital there anymore, Vic. Yeah. But anyway, I, I think the fact that you always attack the problem, attack the problem, not the person. Yeah. And when it's uh, going poorly, it's, it's a multiple reason. Not any one individual is ever held responsible for, for winning or losing. Mm -hmm. And when we won, we won together. When we lost, we lost together. Some guys can be excited mm -hmm. when they played the best game they ever played and got lost and they feel happy. Yeah. The kind of guy you really want is the guy that, that feels bad, even though he did play the best mm -hmm. game. It mm -hmm. still wasn't good enough to overcome the shortcomings of somebody else's performance. So I always remained positive. I always tried to look for uh, the good things that happened within the loss. I yeah. tried to use them as ally. Uh, as teaching tools. Uh, and sometimes you get really upset because you know that you drilled something mentally and physically and emotionally well enough. They should have done it better, but they just didn't focus well that day or had other things on their minds in preparation, didn't practice well all week. You, know, you don't take them off the hook. You hold them responsible, but you don't blame any one person. Yeah. And uh, I always said, if you want a team to get better, the first guy you improve is you, the head coach. Prove it. You, mm -hmm. it starts there, and it mm -hmm. trickles down into everybody else. And then you go into attacking the other kinds of problems that created the negative. But I've always felt, you know, great football teams are better built through adversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vic, and I'm not bragging when I say this. Yeah. The three NFL teams I coached, our winning win loss per, our win percentage the first two seasons with all three of them amounted to 34%. Okay. Our third season was 74% win and playoff games. Okay. And one world championship. Mm -hmm. and, and that world championship team had the worst win loss record in the NFL in the 90s at the time we started. Yep. Okay. Three years later, they're world champions. And if you talk to those guys, first off, when you're losing, most of the time, the losing team has early draft choices. So they had some good draft choices in there, but they just weren't put, to, weren't put together yet. Mm -hmm. There were not enough demanded of them and not enough people uh, eliminated that couldn't meet the standards to be successful somewhere down the road. You know, not everybody is going to be a winner for you. And sometimes you can really you can really spin your wheels and, yeah. and try them so hard that you're like, what's the saying? The squeaking wheel always gets the oil. Yeah, there's a little truth to that. I caught myself doing that at UCLA my first year. Mm. Uh, I was always overworking and, and trying to solve the problems of the kids that had maybe too many problems, like that for me to solve within a year or two. Mm -hmm. And I started uh, I started giving more attention and paying more attention. To the kids that had fewer problems that were working just as hard or harder than anybody else that they end up being better you know like john wooden told me a long time ago mm -hmm. he said don't worry about what you don't have just make what you have the best it can be uh, that's... <laughs> and when you multiply it and put it all together it becomes a very very powerful organization yeah definitely mm -hmm. you know you were very successful in football and now you've made the transition to making wine yeah. Walk me through that a little bit. That's that's a you know, that's a great well, story. First off, I'm not a winemaker. Mm -hmm. I'm not an authority on wine. I, I don't have a sophisticated wine pot palate, but being born in Calistoga in the Napa Valley, I was born in my great grandfather's home, the Italian side of my family, who was in the Napa Valley after being successful in San Francisco, <clears throat> making wine, had a vineyard where we still pick grapes from the same ground that he owned part of. <laughs> So uh, it was sort of in my blood. I grew up helping my grandfather, Vermeil, my dad's dad, make our family wines. Yeah. We'd pick the grapes, we'd do the crushing. I got in there and did it. We, we, you know, you make 50 gallons every year, a new vintage in these things. And I can remember how important it was to my family. On the holiday seat, French-Italian family, 
Mm -hmm. Holidays, new vintage being poured. Friends bringing over their wine bottles with no labels. And, and the, the French would be talking to the French. The Italians would be talking to the Italian. And I had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah. And, but they, I, I got such a great feeling from watching people appreciate, enjoy wine in conversations and with their meal. I said, someday down the road, I'm going to put my dad's name, Jean-Louis Vermeil, exactly pronounced Verme, and my great-grandfather, Jean-Louis Vermeil's name on a wine bottle. It was not my intention to turn it into a business. Mm. It was a hobby. And fortunately for me, there's a little winery named On the Edge Winery up in the mountains above St. Lena, mm -hmm. who was married into the Freddie Annie family that I knew all my life, that owned the vineyard. And he said he would make a Jean-Louis Vermeil Cabernet he was making anyway, instead of bottling it with on the edge label, he would bottle it with Jean-Louis Vermeil Cabernet. Mm. It just so happened in 1999, which was our first release, we won the Super Bowl. So the Vermeil name helped sell that bottle of wine. Mm. And so we said, well, let's keep doing it. So, and it was great. I had no money involved, no partners. It just, he was doing it. And I was, if I wanted wine, I would buy it like I was a retail customer. That's excellent. We did that, and then all of a sudden, I've got a couple of friends with money that are entrepreneurs and wanted to be in the business, the wine business, and they came to me and said, "Can we get involved? You have the mechanics, the, the relationships, the vineyard, and the winemaker. Let's do it together." So we turned it into a business in 2008, making about, I think, 2,000 cases or so the first year, mm. and then now we're we're. Now, right now, after 13 years, we are a successful business. That's We're excellent. in the black. The business is going well. We have about 470 club members now. Excellent. We bottled about 1,800 cases of this 2020 uh, one vintage, uh, less than normal. Normally, we're in a little over 2,000, all the way up to 25, depending on the crush, because we buy our grapes by the row not mm. by the ton. And if the, these six rows produce six tons, we get six tons. If they only produce three tons, we only get three tons. So yeah. that's how much we make. So that's the process. And it, it, we have a tasting room in Napa, California. And, uh, and it's now successful. Yeah. And uh, so, we're, you know, for us, it's never going to be big money. But it's uh, in the black, make a little money. We're paying our bills and we're having fun with it. And uh, We've hit our niche, very little wholesale market anymore at all. We did that initially mm -hmm. to create cash flow. Now we don't have enough wine to do that. So we sell direct. It's quality wine. Yeah. Thomas Brown is our wine consultant. Andy Jones is our winemaker. It's being made at Mending Wall Winery. The grapes are picked at, at Freddie Annie Vineyard. It's a 170-acre vineyard. Mm -hmm. But I've been involved with the vineyard all my life. So... Uh, you know, that's my story. Yeah. And we're actually going to make a Hall of Fame wine. You mentioned me going oh, yeah. into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. We're, we're getting a couple of tons of grape from Beckstoffers in Napa Valley, which is considered one of the finest vineyards in the United States, let alone the Napa Valley. It's, it's a lot more expensive, and it gives our winemakers a little better chance to make even a higher quality wine than we're already making. And our Cabernets are scoring between 96 and 93 all the time now on a consistent basis. Now that team so, uh, you put together, yeah. that a lot of the lessons that came from the football field translate right into your business. I mean, yeah. the patient well, no question that, you know, if you're like your business, if you don't have good people with you, you don't have a chance. Exactly. If all you're doing is solving problems, people that have average or below average motivation or desire to excel or desire to make a contribution to your success, you're not gonna win, especially yeah. true in the NFL. Right. Now, your, your failures won't be on the sport page, won't be on ESPN, and won't be on Monday Night Football. But right. the results can be the same. That's why it's so important to be able to hire the right people. And I was always looking for people that I thought were better than me and, and somebody I could learn from and, yeah. and become better because I'm learning from them as they learn what my strengths are and what I could help them with. And when you put it together unselfishly, it's amazing how much fun you can have. For yeah, for sure. You know, coach, what are your thoughts on, on telehealth? We have obviously through COVID, a lot of people had to get, uh, take care of themselves, see a doctor through the computer. You think that's something that's going to stick around that people are going to continue to use it? Oh, it's here to stay. You yeah. know, I have people 
you know, because I have a celebrity's name. Okay. I can mm-hmm. get a doctor's appointment. All right. I, I have Texas text uh, numbers that I can text my cardiologist and he'll get back to me. I can get you in tomorrow. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you know, most people don't have that advantage. And so I, I think it's critical to be able to communicate early. If you have a problem, you have to wait. And I, I've had people say, I can't get an appointment for three months. Uh, three months. What's the problem going to be like in three months if you have one today? You know, so you never know. <clears throat> and sometimes problems end up being much less severe than you think they are, mm-hmm. but they also end up being much worse than you thought they were going to be. Right. That's where the telehealth uh, uh, can make a, a contribution. And first, and it doesn't have to be the head doctor. It can be a, a cons- you know, a, a quality nurse that experiences and knows what you're talking about. It's yeah. a lot different than, you know, just talking to some guy off the street and yeah. getting an opinion, you know, yeah. everybody's got a cure. Everyone's got opinions, but in a well-organized telehealth program, you're talking to people that know what they're talking about. Exactly. And you're, you're talking to them today. And I, I think, you don't know how, how many people you can save if you start early. Exactly. And like you said, what normally takes sadly months can be done same day. And no we question. can this address is especially the problem. Good. Especially you, well, you were here in Chester County, you know, it's mm-hmm. now we lost two hospitals, including the one you were running. Okay, yeah, no. shut them down. And yeah, no one, no one, they, the, a deal to purchase it and start it over hadn't come through. So, yeah. you know, people are jammed in those areas now, to, and it's tougher to get right to a doctor and confront him, yeah. especially if you're not the former head coach of the Eagles. Okay. That's true. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah. Your Hall of Fame induction coach, what was it like getting the call? Uh, I know Kurt Warner came to your home. What what was it like, Coach? Life's work. I mean, it just that we're we were all so happy when that happened. Well, thank you, Vic. I know you're sincere in saying that. First off, it was beyond my expectation. It was beyond my expectation. People all the time now see me. Oh, Coach, you deserve. Why did it take them so long? Do you know how many coaches I think deserve it just as much as I do? Uh, how about Dan Reeves? Mm-hmm. Okay, Marty Schottenheimer, the eighth winningest coach in football. Both of these guys. Have passed away with over 200 wins, Super Bowl appearances, except for Marty Schottenheimer, Dan Reeves multiple times. You know, how about Tom Coughlin? Yeah. You know, yeah, these kind of guys. Uh, 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 Mike Sh- Mike Shanahan. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Mike Holmgren. You know, Dan Don Coriel. These guys are all George Seifert. To me, they all deserve it, and you know, they've only put now counting me, 11 coaches in the Hall of Fame in the last 26 years. These guys deserve it. So I'm honored. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that 48 people decided it was my turn. But be honest with you, Vic, my wife, my family, my grandkids never sat around a dinner table and ever talked about me going in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Never. Mm-hmm. So it, it was a sort of an overwhelming experience. I knew in a few years past I've been a candidate. I've been talked about each year. With the new system of selecting coaches, we're getting coaches in each year now. They have a five-man panel that go off and just screen the coaches and then select one. And they, so they submit that coach's name to the board of 38, 48 people or 43 other than them. Mm-hmm. And if you get an 80% vote, you get it. If you don't, you don't go in. So when I got the call, in late June that I had, in fact, uh, Dave Baker called me. We were walking through the San Francisco airport on the way to go to do some work in the vineyards. Mm -hmm. And he says, "Uh, coach, I'm calling you and I'm not calling to buy a case of wine. (laughs) (laughs) He said, I'm calling to tell you, you've been selected as the nominee for the coach of the year. If we put a coach in this year, it will be you. Then you saw Kurt Warner show up here and, uh, and it, overwhelming yeah or humbling really is yeah i can't i can't think of another person who deserves it more than you you know i I sincerely i can i can (laughs) (laughs) you know coach to the young people that are trying to build companies trying to get through the challenges of the pandemic you know make something of themselves what what types of advice and inspiration and you give them 
Make sure the motivation to do it is beyond what money you can make doing it. Make sure it's a passion of something you really want to do. And it's not like going to work every day. It's not a grind. It's a challenge and a commitment that you're willing to make, make because you're passionate about wanting to do it. Yeah. And, and you have a vision of what it's going to take. You, you have a, a process defined in your mind, how you're going to do it. You have a, a, a mind of a selection of com committee of the kind of people you want with you uh, and what you're looking for in those people. You have a vision of how you want to end up after so many months, after so many years. Uh, and, and where you, but these things all have to be thought out. And if you have enough good people around you, they'll help you do some of the thinking. You yeah. Know, in all my success, I, I, I've always had a lot of people, a lot of people that could make a contribution and a few that could make a difference. Yeah. The few that can make a difference can direct those that can make a contribution and you collectively put them together yeah. and you can end up being successful. But if you don't have a deep passion, you won't get through the adversity. Right. Yeah. Right. You, won't, you won't get through it. You'll, you'll hang up and think, oh, I don't like this. And you'll, you'll try to go do something different or different or some other profession. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I made up my mind. I wanted to be a football coach mm -hmm. and a, a physical ed teacher. And I got in the physical education classes and I said, you know, I'm not sure I want to stand here five days a week and watch kids take a shower after a PE class and said, throw out the ball and play softball for a few weeks and track for a few weeks and, and soccer for a few weeks. And I want to coach one ball. Mm -hmm. So every time I had an opportunity to move up the ladder, I took it because it gave me an opportunity to spend more time on what I was really passionate about. No doubt. No doubt. I, I can't thank you enough for being on coach. It just oh, every pleasure. time I talk to you, it's so much motivation, so much inspiration. I know our audience is going to feel the same way. I mean, I feel well, like we're in the football field right now. And nobody I had deserves. breakfast yesterday, Vic, at the same market where we had breakfast. Yeah. In yeah. Westchester. Yeah. And you have an ability. Market Street Grill. Yep. <laughs> I remember it well. I remember right. it well. You know, you've always been there for me. You've always been there for your players, for the people you've worked with over the years. And nobody deserves this recognition of the Hall of Fame more than you. Well, thank and, you. You know how I feel about that deserved term, but thank you very much, Vic. I sure. hope your business goes well. I'm pretty confident. In fact, I'm very confident, Will. You got it. You got it, Coach. You got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.